Friends, I'm happy to announce that Straight Talk has partnered with Blue Line Roasting Company to bring you delicious coffee to enjoy while you listen to this podcast. Blue Line Roasting Company also serves our first responders by giving a portion of all net proceeds to numerous organizations who support them. Order today at BlueLineRoasting.com. That's BlueLineRoasting.com. And don't forget, when you join the Straight Shooter VIP Club, you receive a free coffee sample and a mug, plus invitations to private podcast events. There's nothing to celebrate about George Floyd. Nothing. The sooner we put George Floyd in our rearview mirrors, collective rearview mirrors, the better. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. You are tuned to the latest episode of the Straight Talk podcast, and I am your host, America Sheriff David Clark. Thanks for joining me. Well, we just exited a Memorial Day weekend all across the United States. You know, I was a little disappointed in that I didn't see a whole lot of people at some of the Memorial Day celebrations, so to speak. Observance, I should say. That's a better word. Observance. In light of the fact it's about the men and women who have died fighting for our freedom here in the United States, going back to the founding of this great country. And, of course, there's some local news coverage and some national news coverage, so I was able to watch some of it. But I didn't see big crowds. I was real disappointed, you know, that that we, we, we don't observe this national holiday like we should. And I'm not here to lecture anybody in terms of what you should have done on Memorial Day, but it seems that as time goes on, it's it it doesn't have the interest. And what I mean by that is people going to an, a a Memorial Day observance ceremony, a parade, or something. Anyway, it was a violent Memorial Day weekend, and that's keeping in line of. Of of the Memorial Day weekends that have gone on now for the last five or six years, maybe even longer, kind of the start of the unofficial start of the summer season, a lot of people outside. City of Chicago, and this is nothing new, and this will go on now through Labor Day, every weekend, Thursday to Sunday, first thing I do on Monday morning. As I look up either the Chicago Sun-Times or the Chicago Tribune, and I type in shootings from the weekend. So this past Memorial Day weekend in the city of Chicago, 51 people shot, leaving 10 dead. Let me say that again. 51 people shot, 10 dead in the city of Chicago. The once great city of Chicago. They have a new mayor now. Not much is going to change. He's a liberal. He doesn't believe in aggressive policing. He believes that we should reinvest resources into other aspects of the community to quell the violence. It's not going to work. It didn't under his predecessor, Lori Lightfoot, and he's just going to copy the same thing. and Maybe do it more. More of it, more money spent. So they'll get the same result. City of Milwaukee, where I am, 13 shot, leaving three dead. Now, when you look at the two cities, Chicago, you know, has a bigger population, about 2 million maybe. City of Milwaukee has 650,000. So when you look at the rate, the homicide rate or the violence rate in Milwaukee is probably higher. And there's no end in sight to that either. It seems like, because there's no plan to attack the violence, and you have to attack violence. You can't play patty cake with violence with the criminal element. You can't talk to them. The mayor of Milwaukee, Cavalier Johnson, going into Memorial Day, had a week that he called the Peace Initiative, calling for peace in the streets to quell the violence. That's not going to work. People have been calling for the end of violence, the street violence, the criminal street violence, forever. It doesn't work. The only thing that works is assertive policing. You turn the police loose under the Constitution and under your policies. 
and you go after the perpetrators of crime. The problem is, no matter how many people, the police in Milwaukee, Cleveland, Philadelphia, Los Angeles, Chicago, no matter how many people they arrest, you're going to turn them right back onto the streets. Many of them with no criminal charges. That's a plan to fail. And yet these idiot elected officials don't seem to get it. They're all liberal, by the way. These cities I mentioned are all run by liberal Democrats. Mayors, councils, their state reps are all liberal Democrats. So the bodies are stacking up like cordwood. And all anybody can do is say, stop the violence. And then every once in a while, they'll throw in a narrative about gun control, as if that has anything to do with it. And I always remind them, you know what? Guns are spread out evenly across the state. Many, there's just as many guns outside of Chicago and Milwaukee throughout the state, and yet you don't see the violence spread out equally throughout the state. It's only in the black neighborhoods, black and Hispanic neighborhoods, the minority neighborhoods, the poor neighborhoods controlled by liberal Democrats. If it was the gun, then you'd see these same numbers of people killed and shot and maimed all throughout the state. And yet you don't see it. And you don't see it because the gun isn't the problem. So even when you remind them of that, they still don't get it. They're all talk. So it seems like the only plan they have is to wait until the cold weather sets in in October because you'll have fewer people on the streets than fewer targets for the errant shots, the targeted shots, the drive-by shootings. That's the plan. Well, we'll wait for Labor Day, and then we'll see the numbers go down, and we'll declare success. Yet countless people will be violently killed in these cities that Democrats claim to care about. Let's move to Washington, D.C., Not my favorite place, but there's some things going on. And and as I indicated to you from the very onset of this podcast, I am here to give, to drill down into some of these things going on in Washington, D.C., and to give a different perspective. Remember what I said to you, and it was in the last podcast, I'm the voice of dissent. I like to dissent on the prevailing narratives. Because a lot of these prevailing narratives have holes in them, just repeated talking points, because nobody has anything insightful to say about it. So they hear some politicians say it, and then they just start repeating the same damn thing. That's how these narratives start, and that's how these narratives continue. So I think it's in the last podcast, I talked about the Durham investigation, where he comes out with this three, 400-page report basically telling us what we already knew about the investigation. The Trump-Russia collusion was never there. The FBI was in on trying to tamper with an election, trying to change the results of an election, lied under oath, criminality, nobody held accountable. So then I also talked in the last podcast about, and if you don't recall somebody, go back and listen to it. I'm not going to take the people who listen to this podcast every week and and drag you through the stuff that I've already talked about. But there's some follow-up sometimes. So a couple of U.S. senators, I think it was Lindsey Graham and Ron Johnson from the state of Wisconsin, Lindsey Graham from South Carolina, who said they were going to call Durham to testify before Congress as to why nobody was held accountable. Well, you know why nobody was held accountable. Nobody in Washington, D.C. is ever held accountable, except for maybe some low-level Republican, and even Trump. But other than that, they all escape accountability, and they know it, which is why they continue to engage in that behavior. They know nobody's going to do anything to us. They knew that, the FBI officials, when they hatched that plan. Nobody's going to do anything to us. First of all, they never thought it'd see the light of day, but even if they thought it would, they didn't think, oh, my God, we're going to be in big-time trouble. So they want to hear from Durham. 
It says here in this article from the Washington Times, Special Counsel John Durham will testify in front of the House Judiciary Committee on June 21st to discuss his scathing report about the FBI as criticism mounts over his lack of high-profile prosecutions during his sprawling four-year investigation. John Durham wasted four years of our time. He wasted millions of dollars in this four-year investigation to turn up nothing, to turn up stuff we already knew, that they lied, they made it up. So the story here says, sources confirm that Mr. Durham's appearance before the GOP-led panel will come one day after he testifies in front of the House Intelligence Committee in a closed-door hearing. Why is this thing in, in, in front of a closed-door hearing? Why isn't this out in the public so we, the people, can hear and see our government at work? The only time they, they, they really go into closed session is when there's some sensitive stuff, something's confidential, something's top secret. We all get that. Go behind closed doors because they don't want any of that stuff to get out. But we sat up there and watched this thing. Since Trump got elected, there was nothing in Durham's report that he considered confidential or top secret. Why do they feel the GOP-led House, who's the one we want to hear from Durham? Well, guess what? David Clark wants to hear from Durham, too. And I can't hear from Durham in a closed-door hearing. And you, you the people, cannot hear from Durham inside a closed-door hearing. And, and this is just this is a symptom of what's wrong, wrong in Washington, D.C. This should be out in the open. So we can hear. We can hear the types of questions that are being asked. But no, uh-uh. More smoke and mirror. Inside Washington, D.C. And from the GOP, remember in my world, in the straight talk world, there are no sacred cows. I don't come on and waste your time sitting in front of this microphone to protect people. Like a lot of podcasts and, and news stations will do. They're there to protect people, right? Your liberal ones, CNN, the New York Times, Washington Post, they're there to protect people. Democrats. On the other side, you got Fox News, not so much now. They're there to protect Republicans. I'm here to protect you. I'm here to protect freedom and liberty. I'm here to protect this republic, not people. You've heard me say people come and go. But the mission remains the same, the furtherance of freedom and liberty throughout the United States of America. So in another, in another example here, along the same lines, you recall me talking in the last podcast about FBI Director Ray, who refuses to turn over a report that the Oversight Committee is looking for, the House Oversight Committee? Just flat out. It was subpoenaed. That's an order. That's a court order. And Ray just says, nah, we're not interested. We're not turning that over. And then they hide behind this, you know. Oh, it's confidential. We don't want sources. It's a lie. It's a damn lie. And what it was is whistleblower information that they're after. So now Kevin McCarthy, House Speaker, threatens FBI Director Ray with contempt charges over failure to meet Comer deadline. Comer heads up the House Oversight Committee, and he's the one that's been after this report. So it says here, another, uh, from the sources of the Washington Times, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy said Tuesday that Congress would go forward with contempt measures against FBI Director Christopher Ray if he failed to turn over a document that links President Biden to an alleged $5 million foreign bribery scheme when he was vice president. Why is he threatening 
Christopher Ray. This is a subpoena. This is an order. Why is he threatening him? So it goes on to say the California Republican, they're talking about McCarthy, said that if Ray did not follow through and hand over the document Tuesday, we will move to contempt charges against Christopher Ray and the FBI. They are not above the law. You know that famous statement, right? Nobody's above the law. Yes, they are. Christopher Ray's above the law. Hillary Clinton's above the law. Peter Strzok, McCabe, Lisa Page are above the law. James Comey's above the law. Joe Biden's above the law. Hunter Biden is above the law. They're all above the law. And if you're part of the D.C. clique, you're above the law. I get tired of people saying this crap. Nothing's going to happen to Christopher Ray, and he knows it. This is a song and dance. It's smoke and mirrors. We'll rattle some sabers. Oh, they're going to get serious now. Christopher Ray's in big trouble. No, he's not. He's thumbing his nose at these people. Congress has a constitutional duty, not just the authority, a duty to be the oversight over these federal bureaucracies, these unelected bureaucrats. So I don't blame them for going after, but I want to see some action. Hand down the contempt charges. Now, there's two forms of contempt they can go after, and this gets a little dicey here. There's criminal contempt, and then there's the, um, what's it called, the, the, the contempt that's not criminal and it's, it's, uh, it's more of a procedure, procedural. If you go after him criminally on contempt, they have to turn this over to the U.S. Department of Justice. That's Merrick Garland. Ray works within the Department of Justice as the head of the FBI. Civil contempt is a word I was trying to think of. Criminal and civil contempt. Whereas the other one, the civil contempt, if they go after him with civil contempt, they can march into a court, go before a judge, and have a judge order Ray to turn it over. And if he refuses that, the judge can jail him. Until he turns it over. Now, you don't think that's going to happen, do you? Do you really think that a federal judge would order that Christopher Ray be taken into custody and held in jail in contempt until he turns the report over? Come on, folks. Don't do that to yourself. And Christopher Ray knows all this. He's been around, D.C. So again, you know, we get this, this, this dog and pony show. It says here, House Oversight Committee Chairman James Comer, Kentucky Republican, gave Mr. Ray a May 30 deadline to turn over the internal report, unclassified FD-1023 form. It reportedly details an arrangement for an exchange of money or policy decision. They issued the subpoena last month, and it's still not being complied with. A month. Now, if the FBI gave me a subpoena and said, hey, hey, turn this stuff over. Here's a subpoena. We want these records. We want whatever. We want your emails. We want... If I dogged it, if I slow walked it, if I said, no, I'm not turning it over because there's information there that, you know, some information on my friends and stuff, and I don't want them involved in it. I, do you think they would just sit up there and keep threatening me? I'd be in handcuffs and marched into a court, marched before a grand jury. And I'd be ordered to either answer the questions or turn the the records over. And if not, I'd be charged with criminal, not civil contempt, contempt, criminal contempt. But the FBI feels that the law doesn't pertain to them on subpoena. 
They do what they want. So, you know, again, this is how Washington works. And it's just, you know, you look at this and you listen to this and you realize how far gone this is, how broken Washington is, how overbearing Washington, D.C. is, and how the Constitution and the rule of law don't mean anything to these federal bureaucrats. But then they want to hold you and I to that standard of what a subpoena means. Mainstream media has turned into nothing more than state-run propaganda. Bulldog TV was founded by Americans fighting for America to restore the fourth branch of government. Support alternative media like Bulldog TV by following them on Facebook and Truth Social. You talk about race, crime, and politics. Some folks lose sleep over this, but not me. Because I sleep just fine on my Giza Dream Sheets and Pillow from my pillow, especially this new 2.0. If you haven't gotten yours yet, you are missing out. Just go to MyPillow.com and use promo code CLARK at C-L-A-R-K-E and save up to 66% off. The direct link is also available on my website, americasheriff.com. Get a great night's sleep so we can continue the fight. I'm going to get into another thing here bothers the hell out of me, and it should bother the hell out of you. You've heard me talk in, in, in previous podcasts about the FBI, the corrupt FBI. I've called for the abolishment of the FBI, and I don't say that loosely. I don't say that for hyperbole. I don't say that as flamethrowing. That is a corrupt agency with awesome power. We don't need it. Not in a constitutional republic. We do not need it. We will get along fine without the FBI. We want to create something else. And no, there's no fixing it. There's no reform. It's corrupt from top to bottom. And I get tired of people. When I say people, let me be clear. Senators and representatives in Washington, D.C., before they rip the FBI, they say, you know, the majority of the men and women. Uh, are fine, upstanding. The agencies corrupt from top to bottom. And I'm not going to let these agents off the hook that while we're under orders. You've heard me compare that to the Stasi. You don't get away with while we were under orders. You got whistleblowers within the FBI, current and former agents, who are risking it all because they're not going to be a part of this crap. And if that damn FBI at the agent level banded together and did this, then it would show me that they don't don't want to be a part of the corruption. No, they're just going to follow orders. No, we'll just keep our heads down. No, 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 no. Not going to let you get away with it. So one of the people who called for dismantling the disgraced FBI, this story says, is James Comer. Comer, this was before the Republicans were in power. That's where I'm going with this. This is when they were in the minority, and they didn't have any authority to dismantle the FBI or to call people before these committees, the Oversight Committee, the House Intelligence Committee. They didn't have the authority because they were in the minority. Nancy Pelosi was speaker. She wasn't going to do it. And she wasn't going to let whoever the House Oversight Committee was uh, under the Democrats, he wasn't going to do it either. So it's easy when you don't have the authority to talk big, like Comer did. He called for dismantling the disgraced FBI and launching investigations into the activity of big tech giants like Google and Facebook. Comer, he was talking big back then. That's easy to do. So here's what Comer had to say back then. This is 2022. Well, this is serious. This is from usanews.com. 
Well, this is serious, a quote. And this is going to be a top priority for Republicans on the Oversight Committee. We've been talking about this for three straight weeks. It has increased the attention since Elon Musk has started to do the right thing in becoming transparent at Twitter. I was concerned that this was a rogue FBI employee or two, Comer began. But we knew the disgraced FBI was the one communicating with three Twitter employees. This is over the the Hunter Biden, where the FBI was telling Twitter that this was Russian disinformation, not to cover it. So Comer says, this is serious. What else are they involved in at the disgraced FBI? The entire FBI needs to be dismantled. We need to start all over. We need to enact strict reforms. And there need to be checks and balances at the disgraced FBI. That was Comer talking in 2022 before the Republicans took over the House in January of 2023. So now he heads the Oversight Committee. So my my thought was, let's get going. You were talking big. We want to see action. We want to see indictments, referrals. They can't indict, but they can refer over to the Justice Department. I know. Probably not going to go anywhere. That's okay. It's still accountability, and we'll keep the heat on. We'll keep the pressure on. So now, like I said, the GOP is running Congress now. They're the chairs of these these committees. But we're not getting too much out of them. The big talk has ended. The saber-rattling has ended. So then I come across a story, my girl, Marjorie Taylor Greene. You know my stance on her. I love her. But sometimes she could do some things that make you go, eh, why'd you say that? Eh, why'd you do that? And like I said, no sacred cows here. Just because I love you and appreciate you, I'm not going to let that cloud my judgment. If you do some things that I think are, why'd you do that? So anyway, she came out with something this past week, and it says here the title, Washington Times, Marjorie Taylor Greene urges GOP lawmakers to follow through on contempt impeachment threat against Biden officials. Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene said she's not surprised GOP voters have little confidence, that'd be you and me, that Republican lawmakers will hold senior Biden administration officials accountable for not cooperating with White House investigation. And she's warning her colleagues that voters won't forgive them for being all talk and no action. Let me go back to Comer. Comer says, we need to dismantle the FBI. We need to hold people in contempt for not abiding by subpoenas. Where's the action? So the story goes on to say, and she's warning her colleagues that voters won't forgive them for being all talk, no action. There's a lot of people that believe that Republicans actually have to put up or shut up, Ms. Green said. Another quote from her, we don't want the reputation anymore with the people where they go, oh yeah, they're just saying this but they're not going to do anything about it. That's something that our conference needs to fix, and we need to fix it going into 2024. Good for her. That's exactly what I'm talking about. I'm tired of these blowhard Republicans, these do-nothing Republicans. I know what to expect from the Democrats. I'm not surprised by them. So it goes on to say the Georgia Republican said she is constantly pressing her colleagues to take a tougher approach with the administration. Problem for Marjorie Taylor Greene? She's flying solo on this. I don't hear any of her other colleagues saying, yep, yep, I'm with her. Yep, it's time for action. No, they're like, oh man, I wish she would shut up. Why is she reminding the American people of what we were saying back when we were in the minority? 
So she says, she goes on to say, that's something I'm urging all the time. I keep saying, why would voters elect us if we just allow this to continue? I urge my conference, why would they vote for us, she said. He goes on to say, Rep- Republicans have threatened articles of impeachment, contempt charges, and call for the resignation of senior-level Biden administration officials, including the impeachment of President Biden himself. Among the top officials targeted by House Republicans are Homeland Security Sec- Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas and Attorney General Merrick Garland. I remember those calls from Republicans. We take over, we're going to impeach Mayorkas over this border. They've basically left Mayorkas alone lately. Ever since the, the, the Title 42, which was a couple of weeks ago, I haven't heard any of them talk about Mayorkas. I haven't heard any of them talk about the border either, really. They've moved on from that. On to the next thing, the debt ceiling. Yeah, this is what we're going to talk about now. It's just one theater act to another. That's all Washington, D.C. is. All theater. So, there's a couple of polls out there. A recent poll by Rasmussen showed that less than a third of voters expect Congress, which the GOP controls, a slim house majority, to impeach Biden, even though most voters in the survey suspect he has committed impeachable offenses as president. What about we the people? It goes on to say here only 28% of voters think it is likely that Congress will go forward with impeachment proceeding against Biden, including 11% who say it is very likely. In the poll, 66% of respondents said they do not think it is likely Congress will pursue impeachment, including 37% who say impeachment is not at all likely. You know what? The American people, they know. The American people are smart. The politicians in Washington, D.C. think you're stupid. They think you're forgetful. And then you wonder why there was no red wave back in November of 2022. Because the American voters just, uh, yeah, maybe. Because nothing changes in Washington, D.C. Nothing ever will change in Washington, D.C. It needs to be dismantled. It needs to be deconstructed and rebuilt in the image of the United States Constitution the way the framers decided, designed it. That's what needs to happen, yet too many people sit around waiting for the next election. I heard somebody the other day on the debt ceiling, a Republican lamenting, well, you know, we only have one half of one third of, of government here. Democrats control the Senate and the White House. All we control is the House. You had all three before. You had it under Trump. And you did nothing with it. You did nothing on the border. You did nothing on immigration. You fought Trump on on building a border wall. You didn't get him an immigration bill where he called for a four-point plan to at least provide the framework that Congress could discuss and come up with. And they did Paul Ryan, John Boehner, Mitch McConnell did nothing. You know why? They don't want to fix immigration. They want to use it as a wedge issue to raise money and try to win votes. Yeah, you vote for me and I'll do, you know, set you free. The American people are done with that crap, ladies and gentlemen. You should be. I know why I am. That's why I talk about this stuff. I don't point out, well, here's what we need to do. You know, we need to uh, secure the border. They're not interested. DHS under, even under Trump, he got pushback from John Kelly as secretary of DHS and then Kirsten Nielsen. They were open border people under Obama. That stuff yields too much fruit to fix, to solve. You get those fundraising letters from your Congressional delegation, right? 
the ones with the survey, you know, do you support fixing the border, closing the border? Do you this, 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 this? Neither party is interested in immigration reform. Neither party. Neither party is interested in fixing the crisis that is federal spending. Both parties spend too much. They're all in. They're both in on it. Republicans aren't for smaller government, limited government. They say they are, but their actions don't show it. They vote to approve these omnibus packages that expand the federal government and increase spending and increase the federal debt. Republicans. Yeah, I know, you know, they come out, they rattle a few savers, you know, during the hearings. Oh, we got to get spending under control, this, that, and then they, they vote for this crap anyway. I'm under no illusion, and either, neither should you be. I'm under no illusion that anybody in the Congress is interested in getting spending under control. Yeah, I know you can, you know, Rand Paul and a couple other people are, but that's about it. That's it. And Rand Paul needs to do more to call his party out. Call him out by name. Name names, ruin lives, ruin careers. Call them out by name. These people professing to be Republicans and conservative Republicans and fiscal, fiscally conservative Republicans. Yet approving these continuing rev- resolutions because they don't have a budget. They haven't had one in over 20 years. October 1st is supposed to have a budget in place. They don't do it. They just, they use the continuing resolution rule. We'll just continue what we did last year, and then we'll we'll put in the rate of inflation. Then they throw in all this extra spending in the continuing resolution or the omnibus package. More spending. All right, enough of Washington, D.C. Next, I want to cover something, and what we're going to be involved with here is the intersection of race and professional athletics. And that's an interesting intersection. I come across a story, USA Today. We're at the French Open. French Open is going on right now. Sloan Stevens says racism against athletes has only gotten worse. Now I'm going to read a lot of this because it's going to set the stage for how I'm going to approach this. American women's tennis player Sloan Stevens said racist attacks against athletes has only intensified recently and added that artificial intelligence software designed to thwart hateful messages has little effect. Now, keep in mind, she's saying this software has little effect. I don't know if it does or not, but she's saying that. Quote from her, yes, it's obviously been a problem my entire career, Stevens said Monday at the French Open. It has never stopped. If anything, it's only gotten worse. Stevens, who is black, said she's not used the software that's being offered to players in this year's French Open that is designed to filter offensive social comments and prevent them from ever reaching their target. So she's given software, and yet she says the software to thwart the hateful message has little effect. How does she know? She says she hasn't used it. Then she goes on to say, I did hear about the software, Stephen says. I have not used it. And how does she know it's not effective? And I don't know whether it is or not. So she says, I have a lot of obviously key words banned on Instagram and all of those things, but it doesn't stop some people from typing in an asterisk or typing in a different way, which obviously software most of the time doesn't catch. Okay. Let me ask you, Sloan. I don't have anything against Sloan, Stephen. Why are you reading that crap in the comments section on your Instagram account? Let me let you in on a little secret, ladies and gentlemen. I have a 
Facebook account. I have a Twitter account. I have an Instagram account. I do not read the comment section. I post what I have to say. I usually link an article to it. I have a comment on the article. And I have, I don't know, 830,000 followers. I don't read the comments. I don't care about the comments. I'm just saying, here's my thought on this story here. People can have, I'm not telling them that they shouldn't be able to comment. I could block all the people. I could just have certain people. I, I don't care who comments. Let everybody comment. Why the hell would I read it? A lot of it's going to be hateful. How do I know I used to? But I'm talking like, I don't know, 10 years ago. I used to read the comments. And I used to comment back, getting the back and forth. I stopped doing that. Why? There's nothing but idiots on these, for the most part. These are idiots. They're hiding behind stage names, fake accounts, burner accounts, some ugly, vile stuff. Yeah, I know they're out there. So she's up there reading this stuff. Is she a glutton for punishment? So back to the story here. Though she didn't address a specific case, Stevens said it was concerning when the FBI has had to investigate racist behavior against athletes. Let me comment on that. She didn't address a specific case. She's just throwing out generality. Oh, it's a racist world, and it's getting worse. Well, yeah, it's a racist world. Part of the human condition. I don't deny that. I don't know that it's gotten worse. I mean, I don't see anybody being lynched like there were post-Reconstruction. Newly freed slaves were still being lynched. Crosses burned on you. I'm not seeing that. So I'm not discounting the fact that racism exists in this world and in this country. Part of the human condition. Part of the flawed part of being human. We have flaws. People who are severely flawed. That spew this filth. And she says the FBI has had to investigate racist behavior against athletes. If I'm the writer of this column, by the way, it's Lorenzo Reyes. He's, he's engaged in journal, journalistic malpractice. If she said to me, and I'm interviewing Slow Stevens, the FBI has had to investigate racist behavior against athletes, I go, oh, wow. How do you know that, uh, Miss Stevens? Have they contacted you? Where's the follow-up question? Can you give me a specific case? And she can't. And it just makes me very suspect of what Sloan Stevens is engaged in here. I'm not saying she hasn't faced racism, but she's just throwing out these generalities. So anyway, she's ranked number 30 in the world. She's a pretty good tennis player. I've seen her play. Like in Wimbledon or French Open, uh, I think last year she made the finals. So it's hard to not have watched her. You know, I watch with a passing interest, the big tennis tournaments, like golf, you know, the big golf tournaments or anything Tiger Woods is involved in, which hasn't been too much lately, but I'd watch. So she goes on to say, obviously, it's been something that I have dealt with my whole career. I think like that. I think that, like I said, it's only continued to get worse, and people online have the free reign to say and do whatever they want behind fake pages, which is obviously very trouble, troublesome, she says. Yes, that's why you should not be reading it. If you want to, you know, engage and, you know, say, hey, it's happy to win today. Thanks for all the support. But what's she reading the damn comment section for? Looking for validation? Oh, we love you, Sloan. Oh, you're the best. That's probably what she's looking for. And so when she bumps into this hateful stuff, she's taken by surprise. So it says, racist behavior directed at athletes is getting worse, and even software designed to protect them has had little impact, she says. Wow. Well, it's 
So the writer, Reyes, why didn't he contact the FBI for a comment? Are you guys investigating? First of all, the FBI should not be doing this, by the way. Should not be monitoring the social media where people aren't engaged in any sort of criminal behavior. Racist? What are you going to charge them with? Federal racism? I'm tired of the FBI monitoring American citizens unless it's for the purpose of there's some some noted criminal activity here. And mainly we're talking about, you know, for instance, uh, uh, terrorism. I could name a couple things. Yeah, they should be monitoring for that. Ladies and gentlemen, it is amazing how of all of the recent Mass murderers, people committing mass murder, mass shooting, were active on social media, and the FBI didn't find it until after the act was completed. Because then they go back and look at their social media. Those are the people they should be looking for. The ones with these cryptic messages about mass murder. And every time... We find out about a mass murder after the event. We find out they were hinting at this on social media, but the FBI's looking for people making racist comments to professional athletes. Where's, where are the priorities here? You're missing the big stuff. That's why you're unable to interrupt a potential mass murder because you're looking for racist stuff. This makes no sense. So why didn't this, and I'm just going by the article here, USA Today. Why didn't this reporter go to contact the FBI and say, are you investigating racism? Uh, Sloan Stevens, I was talking to a professional player and Roland Garros for the French Open is, and, and she says uh, the FBI has had to investigate. Are you guys trying to get a comment? They're probably not going to comment, right? They usually don't. And they'll say ongoing investigation. And then the next sentence will be, they did not return a call for comment. That's okay. At least try. It's part of your duty. She's making some very serious claims of racism. Toward professional athletes, it's getting worse. Yet she can't produce any statistics or any specific cases, I should say. And she throws in here the FBI's had to investigate. I don't know if she did that for effect or what. Now, I'm not going to sit up here and try to say that or, or think or intimate that I know what her experiences are with racism on the tennis circuit. Look, she's involved in a country club sport. It's mainly white. It's like professional golf. It's a country club sport. Some of what I think might be at play, and I said I'm not going to stand in judgment of what her experiences are. I don't know what her experiences are. She might be telling the complete truth. That's okay. That's not what I'm here to contest. It's why she... Looks at the comments. She's her own worst enemy sometimes. That's why I don't look at my comment section. Never. I'm not, te- I'm not even tempted. Well, let's see what people are saying about this tweet or Instagram post. I don't care. Good, bad, or indifferent. I don't need to have people validate, you know, Sheriff Clark, you're the best. You should run for president. I, I don't need that kind of validation. Not worth the headache. I'm just offering my take on things. That's all. So I I, I don't know. I was just this article just kind of like peculiar. I'm like, I'm not talking about the French Open. I'm not talking about racism. Wow. That's why I said sometimes the intersection of intersection and, and the politics of, of of race and athletics can get a little weird sometimes. I'm not denying the existence of it for professional athletes. Do you know who we never heard from? 
I hear from him about this sort of stuff, and I bet he's faced the same hate and racism. You never hear Tiger Woods lament and whine about, oh, the racism, people hate me, and white people. You never hear Tiger Woods go there. I am sure, ladies and gentlemen, that people say hateful things about Tiger Woods because it's part of the human condition. And he's engaged in a country club sport, you know, predominantly, you know, played by white suburban people. Maybe upper middle class, but, you know, because they belong to country clubs. That's why I call it a country club sport. You're a city kid growing up. First of all, even if you can find a tennis court, which are few and far between, what do you play in the winter? Where these country club sports, they belong to these expensive country clubs. They can play all year. They can afford trainers and coaches. And Sloan Stephen Hassel, there's nothing wrong. Good for her. Just like Tiger Woods. Good for you. Yet they'll let you play on these elite courses. And they'll let you in. You pull up to any country club in America. Hey, Tiger Woods is out. I didn't know he's not a member. No, he's not a member. Uh, yeah, I thought I'd, you know, get in a quick, you know, 18. Do you mind? No, come on in. Well, I'm not a member. That's all right. It's a country club sport. There's nothing wrong with being a country club sport, but, you know, she has to understand. She's in shark-infested waters. I get that. But here's another thing that bothered me. She says it's getting worse all the time. See, you got to, this is how I read, ladies and gentlemen. When I read, I read and I listen to every word and I hang on. And I look and I find stuff like this. I go, wait a minute, getting worse? How? Can you imagine what Jackie Robinson went through? And she claims it's getting worse? Can you imagine what Bill Russell, great from the Boston Celtics, who talked about this stuff in books, the racism of people, the ugliness of people, back then, it was worse. It was at its apex back then. It is not now. She has no idea what Jackie Robinson and Fritz Pollard, the first black to play Professional football. Can you imagine what they put up with? I mean, even in the 60s, when Jim Brown played for the Cleveland Browns, actually was in college at Syracuse, when they went down south to play a game, they couldn't stay. The black players couldn't stay in the hotels the white players were staying in because it was segregated. And Sloan Stevens is going to tell me she's probably staying in five-star hotels, for heaven's sakes. What does she mean it's gotten worse? No, it has gotten way better, Sloan. Read your history. Go back and study some of the pioneers of these sports that were all white. Baseball wasn't a country club sport when Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier, but it was all white. And the fans were calling him the N-word from the stands. And I don't think the FBI was there monitoring for racist comments. And he had to endure that crap. And you ought to thank him. And you ought to thank thank the countless other pioneers. Jackie Robinson, Bill Russell, Fritz Pollard, Tiger Woods. Now, he wasn't the first black golfer, but he was the first one to reach that stage of that sport. You know, there's rather Lee Elder, and there were some others. Those are the pioneers. They probably had to put up with more racism than Sloan Stevens today, and I don't mean because some idiot gets online and, you know, says something nasty about her. No, it hasn't gotten worse, Sloan. It's gotten better, but it's not perfect, and it never will be. Stop reading that crap. Focus on your game. You're number 30 in the world. You haven't won a major. Focus on that instead of reading the comment section 
and saying the woe is me because there's racism in the world. And it's all over the world. It isn't just the United States. And make it better for the next generation. And help somebody else trying to, you know, go down to some of these central city parks and interest, you know, these black kids are playing tennis and show them a few things and, you know, stuff like that. It's gotten worse. <laughs> wow. you See, this is what happens when you don't know your history. And many of these people, and it isn't just athletes, it's all these other race baiters who talk about how terrible this country is, no opportunity. What? There are more, there's more opportunity now for black people than at any time in our history. What do you mean there's no opportunity? With hard work, perseverance. I mean, she's gotten this far with that. Hard work. You don't get to be 30 in the world in the world by being a slouch. But if she wants to break the top 10, she should put that other crap aside and focus, go learn your history and focus on your tennis. And I'm not telling her to hit the ball and shut up. That's not my attitude. If you're going to open your trap, like I always say, before I open my big trap, I go do some research, and that's the first thing I thought of. I said, what about Jackie Robinson? What about, you know, Jim Brown, who couldn't stay in a white hotel with his other teammates because it was segregated? And she's staying in five-star hotels, probably flying private jet. Good for her. Stop the whining about how it's worse. It's not worse. It is Much better. Long way to go, but it's much better. Now, another aspect of race. I can't wait to get to this one. The other day, I was going through Instagram, not mine, just, you know, thumbing through the feeds, and I come across this post about Megyn Kelly, former Fox news host. Now she's with, I think she's with Sirius. And she was having a conversation with Victor Hansen, who's a uh, columnist, noted Victor Hansen. I've met him numerous times. Great writer. And she was covering this segment on The View. Now, first of all, I don't watch The View. I don't watch much TV. Because it's, it's an idiot box. Yeah, I know. You know, people like Netflix and they like Hulu and all this. That's fine. Some of the shows on there, that's fine. This stuff just doesn't interest me. All these series going on. I've watched a couple of them, and I never really got into watching a whole season. It just doesn't interest me. But that's just me. But The View. The View. Those people that sit on that panel, Whoopi Goldberg, Joy Behar, and and whoever else is on there. See, I don't watch it, so I don't know. But I know those two idiots are on there. Those are two of the biggest idiots I've ever heard from. They're complete imbeciles. They don't know anything. They're airheads. They probably never read to learn something before they open their big fat mouths and they just sit up there and they just throw flame. Now, I know they have an audience, the view. I I don't know if people watch for entertainment or enlightenment or they want to learn something from those idiots. So anyway, I'm going to play you a clip. Again, you know, Megan Kelly brought this up. And it was Behar. The Joy Behar? I don't even know her first name. And she's babbling on about Tim Scott entering the presidential race. 
And she said, and you're going to hear the clip. But I'll just set the stage for you. She basically criticized these two for being conservative Republicans. And I say two, she threw Clarence Thomas in it. See, she just lumps all of us. I'm a conservative. She lumps all black conservatives in this group. She goes, I talk about pulling themselves up by their bootstraps. And and she, first of all, she has never met these people, probably never even went back and read the stories of these people. To even be commenting. So listen to what she says about Tim Scott and Clarence Thomas. And he's one of these guys who, you know, he's like Clarence Thomas, black Republican who believes in pulling yourself by your bootstraps rather than to me understanding the systemic racism that African-Americans face in this country and other minorities. He doesn't get it. Neither does uh, Clarence. Right. And that's why they're Republicans. Yeah. <laughs> Did you hear that? Joy Behar going to lecture me? I'm a conservative, you know, I, I, okay, I'm a black conservative, but, you know, why isn't Victor Davis Hanson, why don't they call him a white conservative? Why don't they call, uh, you know, any white conservative? They don't put the race in there. Oh, so-and-so the white conservative. But with black, we have to carry that label around. I was a black conservative. I have to listen to Joy Behar. Did you hear that part where she says, they don't understand the black experience like I do? Like I understand. Did you catch that? Joy Behar going to lecture me and Clarence Thomas and Senator Tim Scott about the black experience? That is insulting. That is indignant. That is filth. And I'm not going to stand for it. And I'm not going to let anybody get away with it. This woman's a complete imbecile. And then to hear at the end, the audience was clapping. And it was kind of a half heart. Like, it was almost like, oh, we don't know what to do with this. This is a little cringe word. You could tell because they weren't raucous. They just kind of politely clapped. She chuckled. And then she's sitting on that panel. And I know Whoopi Goldberg was there. And there was another black female. Like I said, I don't want to show. I don't know who's on it. And they didn't say anything. And they didn't like, wait a minute, Joy, what black experience are you talking? Just ask her. What black experience do you have? No, they sat there letting her get away with that crap. That was even more indignant. I would have loved to have been on that panel and had Joe Behar say that, because that's what I was, wait, 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 wait. Behar, what a black experience are you talking about? So I got to thinking after I listened to that, you know, because she was basically poking at Republicans and black conservatives and black Republicans. And that's what they do on that show. I get it. Well, like I said, I don't watch it. But I was going through my Instagram, and this was about Megyn Kelly. I like to hear what she has to say. That's how I came across it. So I thought, you know who doesn't know about the black experience and who is black? Who one of those other two blacks on the panel should have brought up? Barack Hussein Obama. He doesn't know about the black experience. He spent a lot of years trying to build up his black bona fides before he ran for president, before he ran for senator, because he knew he had to. There's stories written on this. Stories by people who like him. He had to nurture, cultivate his black bona fides because he really didn't have any. He had to prove he was down with the struggle because he had no experiences growing up poor and black. Because that's the first guy that came to my mind. It wasn't Tim Scott and Clarence Thomas. It's not the black experience. I'll tell you who doesn't know about the black experience. Barack Hussein Obama. Now let me read a little from his bio. Remember when I said I do my 
my freaking homework before I babble in front of this microphone. And these other idiots out there, they don't do it. You'll see that's a common theme when you listen to my podcast. People who have no idea what they're talking about. Talking as if they do. So I went and did some comparison. Let me read from Barack Obama's bio. His early life. And I'm not criticizing him. Good for him. He didn't have to grow up in the ghetto. But he knew, which is why he sat in the church of that Jeremiah Wright, that black racist spewing all that hateful rhetoric because you have to get through Jeremiah Wright to get your black card stamp if you're going to be in politics in the state of Illinois. And he knew it. Obama's father, also named Barack Hussein Obama, grew up in a small village in Kenya as a member of the Luau ethnicity. This is his father. His father won a scholarship to study economics at the University of Hawaii, where he met and married Ann Dunham, a white woman from Wichita, Kansas whose father had worked on oil rigs during the Great Depression and bought and fought with the U.S. Army in World War II before moving his family to Hawaii in 1959. Barack and Ann's son, Barack Hussein Obama Jr., was born in Honolulu in 1961. And it goes on to talk about his education. Good for him. Good stuff. Good start in life. Raised by white folks. His dad abandoned him. That's in part of this thing here. But I'm not here to, to, to slam Barack. But I'm thinking of Joy Behar. Black experience? And you want to talk about how Tim Scott and Clarence Thomas don't understand the black experience, but you do? Joy Behar? So let's compare that to Tim Scott and Clarence Thomas, who she eviscerated. And, you know, I, before I go there, you know, this, this bio here goes into his education. I flipped over that. I should read a couple lines here. At age 10, Obama returned to Hawaii to live with his maternal grandparents. He attended an elite private school where, as he wrote in his 1995 memoir, Dreams of My Father, he first began to understand the tensions inherent in his mixed racial background. That's what Obama was struggling with to this day. His mixed background, and there's nothing wrong with that. But he struggled with that psychologically. See, that's why he had to improve his black bona fide before he ran for president. You know, he was he was engaged to a white woman before he met Michelle, and he broke off the engagement. This is documented. Because he thought it would hurt his chances to run for president if he's married to a white woman. So he married Michelle. What a conniver. But anyway, you saw he attended an elite private high school. Now let's look at Clarence Thomas. The black experience that Joy Behar says he doesn't have. Here's from his bio. Justice Clarence Thomas has lived a uniquely American life. Born in June of 1948 in a small coastal community of Pinpoint, Georgia a community founded by free slaves after the Civil War. Thomas grew up in the segregated south of the Jim Crow era, Behar. Thomas's father deserted the family when Thomas was very young. When Thomas was seven, his mother sent Clarence and his younger brother to live in the home of his maternal grandparents, Myers, Miles and Christine Anderson, and Savannah. His father's influence on Thomas, his grandfather's influence on Thomas, was so profound he called him daddy and titled his memoir, Justice Thomas wrote, My Grandfather's Son. By the way, I read that book. Matter of fact, I got an autographed copy. When I met Justice Thomas in his chambers one day for a chat. So Thomas wrote of his grandfather, he was my one hero in life. He's what made me what I am today. He's born and raised in the segregated south of the Jim Crow era. Bayhard, you wench. He doesn't understand the black experience that he escaped poverty. Went on to get his bachelor's degree from Holy Cross and then graduated Yale Law. Joy. 
You understand the black experience more than him. You're sickening, you filthy wench. Now let's look at Tim Scott, another one who she said, doesn't understand the black experience like I do, white woman. Here's Tim Scott's bio, part of it. Growing up in a poor, single-parent household in North Charleston, South Carolina, a young Tim Scott grew accustomed to moving every few years, as well as all the long hours of his mom work that his mom worked to keep a roof over their heads. Joy, did you know that? You stupid lady. It says here, after failing four courses his freshman year of high school, Tim's path forward was murky at best. But thankfully, he had a mom who stuck with him and met a mentor that showed him the wisdom of conservative principle. Through their brief and his own determination, Tim got his grades back on track, graduated from Charleston Southern University, and eventually built his own successful small business. Yes, he lifted himself up by his bootstraps. You went. I want to call you more than that, Behar, but in the decency of my audience, I'm going to refrain from that this time. But if you ever poke your head out of your hole again and talk like this, I'm going to really get indignant on you to the point that it might go viral, and I'll enjoy the hell out of responding to it, what I said. Because you are a disgrace. You are stupid. You're an imbecile. Challenging the person, Clarence Thomas, grew up in the segregated Jim Crow era, and Tim Scott, growing up poor, in a single-parent household in North Charleston, South Carolina, and you're going to say, they don't understand the black experience with racism like I understand. She said that. Go back and listen to it. Never should have stuck your head out of that hole and, 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 and had me come across it. Boy, that was my lucky day. Friends, I want to thank you for listening to today's episode of Straight Talk with yours truly, America Sheriff David Clark. And a special thank you also goes out to our sponsors. My goal, as always, is to break down these complex and many times controversial issues and bring it to you straight with a little dose of common sense, no media bias, no talking points, just truth. And this podcast would not be possible without your support. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, please leave a review at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite place to listen. And please share this message of common sense sense on social media. For more content, be sure to follow me on Truth Social, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And just a reminder, we'd love for you to join our Straight Shooters VIP podcast club for only $5 per month. And with that membership, you'll receive invitations to attend private podcast events throughout the year as a VIP guest when we come to your town. Plus, if you join today, you'll also receive a free coffee mug and a sample of our private label coffee as long as supplies last. Subscribe and join at americasheriff.com. This podcast is brought to you by americasheriff.com with executive producer Judy Wilkinson of J.L. Wilkinson Consulting and producer Josh Wentz in partnership with our friends at Bulldog Media. If you are interested in partnering with Straight Talk Podcasts or having me speak in your area, please contact Judy at Consulting at gmail.com, 706-518-2116. That's Consulting at gmail.com, phone number 706-518-2116. 